This episode contains language that some listeners will find offensive. Please use discretion. Norman Mailer would have turned 100 years old on January 31st, 2023. The centenary of his birth occasioned no parades in his honor in the places he called home, Brooklyn, New York, Provincetown, Massachusetts. But there may have been, in some faculty lounge or in a tavern where writers meet to be literary together, someone raising a glass to Norman Mailer, to his writing, to his legacy. But was anything said in those tributes about the night Norman Mailer stabbed his wife? How do we reckon with this event, 63 years after it happened, and with Mailer many years gone? What are some things that happened to Mailer after the stabbing that might help put that event into perspective? Episode 6, Last Words When Norman Mailer stabbed his wife Adele in 1960, he was 37 years old. He lived another 47 years, and in those years, he won the National Book Award and he won the Pulitzer Prize, twice. He wrote more novels, more nonfiction. He appeared on television and in public events. He tried his hand at directing and acting in several films of his own creation. He had a cameo role in the 1981 movie Ragtime, directed by Milos Forman. And in 1987, Mailer directed a film adaptation of one of his own novels, Tough Guys Don't Dance. The list of Mailer's achievements big and small, and of varying critical reception, goes on at length. There are a few events in particular, however, that are worth calling attention to in any discussion of how to view the stabbing of 1960. In 1965, Dial Press published Norman Mailer's novel An American Dream, which had been serialized in Esquire magazine. The protagonist of the story, Stephen Rojak, who shares some biographical details with Norman Mailer himself, murders his estranged wife, strangling her to death in her own home. Afterward, Rojak has sex with his wife's maid, then throws his wife's body over her balcony to try to make her death look like a suicide. The rest of the novel follows Rojak on an odyssey, of more sex and more violence. When Gore Vidal and Mailer sparred on the Dick Cavett Show in 1971, Vidal adduced this novel as an example of what he saw as Mailer's sad, disturbed fascination with violence. Kate Millett, in her book Sexual Politics, criticized an American dream and Mailer himself for creating a misogynistic, murdering hero, who, unlike characters in Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy and Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, escapes accountability for his crimes. A second event worth considering is Mailer's second bid for mayor of New York City in 1969. This time, Mailer got on the ballot along with his running mate, Jimmy Breslin, a street-smart, hard-boiled columnist for several New York City newspapers. Campaigning under the campy slogans, Vote the Rascals In, and No More Bullshit, Mailer and Breslin undertook a vigorous schedule of public appearances, but they favored college campuses, where audiences were tolerant, indeed approving, of curse words from the podium. Not a few observers thought that the Mailer-Breslin ticket was a stunt, a joke, a bid for self-promotion. But Mailer and Breslin were in earnest. Mailer himself thought that they could and would win. Their electability notwithstanding, Mailer and Breslin were entertaining as candidates. They were frank, blunt, and mad as hell. Mailer was the poet and philosopher. Breslin was his pit bull. 
and their city, New York City, was in such a sorry state in 1969, surely some voters were willing to consider that it might be time to elect outsiders, people with no political experience, but with daring ideas and a flair for the dramatic. The Mailer campaign effectively collapsed at one of its own fundraisers on the night of May 7, 1969, at a nightclub in Greenwich Village called The Village Gate. On that night, Norman Mailer got drunk and perhaps was itching to vent his frustration with himself and with his own quixotic enterprise. He took the microphone and, addressing his audience of volunteers, berated them as spoiled pigs. Mailer was heckled, but he invited those hecklers to have sex with themselves. Mailer didn't stab anyone that night, but he certainly did shoot himself in the foot. The following morning, campaign manager Joe Flaherty scoured the New York Times, fearing the worst. In Flaherty's book, Managing Mailer, a campaign chronicle, he wrote, We had the good fortune that a family newspaper would have trouble reporting the event. The Post of New York mentioned the event, but left out scurrilous details. The Times checked in, but not on page one. It didn't seem to occur to Joe Flaherty, in his book, that the print media at that time couldn't be bothered with reporting the drunken, foul-mouthed self-destruction of a candidate who had no chance of winning. So once again, Mailer aimed high, and he fell short. He had big ideas, but few practical plans, and not many of his ideas for New York City had anything to do with when people's garbage was going to get picked up or how quickly their street would be plowed of snow. So why would Mailer put himself through this exercise a second time? Well, by 1969, with one Pulitzer Prize to his name, Mailer may have felt that he owed it to himself to give a run for office another try. Secondly, as I stated in the first episode of this podcast, Mailer may have wanted to run for mayor to best his contemporary Gore Vidal, who had tried unsuccessfully to run for Congress. Thirdly, in 1965, Mailer watched William F. Buckley Jr. run for mayor of New York City. Buckley lost too, but his campaign was meant to call attention to what Buckley saw as true conservative ideas and to siphon votes away from Democratic candidate John Lindsay. Buckley was unsuccessful insofar as Lindsay won, but Buckley enjoyed his own private victory in the sense that his campaign elevated his public profile as a person of consequence, a paragon of American conservatism. Buckley also had a sense of humor about himself. When asked what his first order of business would be if elected mayor, Buckley replied, Demand a recount. Some people run for office to lose well, and what Gore Vidal and William F. Buckley Jr. did, which Norman Mailer seemed incapable of doing, was lose without making themselves look ridiculous. A few years after losing this second bid for mayor of New York City, on February 4, 1973, Norman Mailer held his 50th birthday party, not this time at his own place of residence, but at the Four Seasons Hotel in New York City. It's worth pausing to contrast Mailer's own birthday party and a party from 1966, seven years earlier, Truman Capote's black and white ball. That event, what has been called the party of the century, took place a four-minute walk from the Four Seasons at the Plaza Hotel. Capote spent months meticulously curating an eclectic guest list of people from politics, movies, and the arts, as well as personal friends. In 1966, Truman Capote was as famous as he would ever be. His book, In Cold Blood, was a critical success and a commercial bestseller. 
and to avoid the gauche appearance of throwing a party for himself, Capote convinced Catherine Graham, then the publisher of the Washington Post, to be the guest of honor. Capote invited 540 people to his black and white ball. Approximately 500 came. It was a historic night that will likely never be reproduced or seen again. Now advance to 1973. Norman Mailer sends party invitations to no fewer than 5,000 people with the promise that that night he would make a major announcement. Approximately 10% of invitees showed up, including Mailer's third wife, his fourth wife, his then mistress and the mother of his youngest child, and yes, Adele Morales Mailer. Guests were given the option of paying either $30 per person or $50 per couple. Now remember, this is 1973. A rough estimate at relative value would be $150 per person or $250 per couple. Even reporters, domestic and international, were made to pay. As much as the assembled partygoers reportedly joked that the price of admission would subsidize Mailer's vasectomy, there was an undercurrent of resentment. Then, as now, no one who is anyone, pays to attend a party, on a Monday night, no less. Dinner came and was cleared, cocktails were flowing, and finally, around midnight, Mailer assumed the podium, cocktail in hand, to lead with a joke. This, for the record, was the joke. A man is at a party, and he sees his ex-wife, who is now on the arm of another man. The former husband approaches the new one and asks, how do you like sticking it in that washed up old cunt? To which the new husband replies, not so bad, once you get past the washed up part. That was Mailer's opening joke. With the ice thus broken, Mailer announced that he wanted to start a foundation called the Fifth Estate, to police the FBI and the CIA. Secret surveillance, Mailer said. Conspiracies, he said. J. Edgar Hoover, Jack Kennedy's assassination. Then Mailer opened the floor to questions. None came. Abandoning the stage, Mailer vowed, MacArthur-like, to return for more questions and conversation. He did not. Only two weeks prior to this party, the 37th President of the United States had been sworn in, Richard Nixon, who, upon losing his gubernatorial bid in California in 1962, had enjoined the press that in the future they might send one lonely reporter on the campaign who will report what the candidate says now and then. The night of Mailer's birthday party, the reporter sent by the Village Voice, the newspaper which Mailer had co-founded in 1955, was Lucian K. Prescott IV, a former World War II general and colleague of Patton. Who else? Prescott was as friendly to Mailer in print as one could imagine a fellow general being, writing, There is and has always been a solid totalitarian streak running through the heart of Norman Mailer. He is a leader, and because he cannot lead with commands or orders, he must lead with ideas. Prescott added, There is a visceral, almost sexual excitement about command and control. Yielded to once, the desire to lead is never lost. The most divergent take on the evening came from literary critic John Leonard, who covered the event for the New York Times. The evening, Leonard declared, would be a success only if Mailer made a fool of himself. He didn't, Leonard added, a verdict that may have secured Leonard's place for the evening 
as minority leader. Leonard waxed about Mailer's relationship with the audience, any audience, writing that Mailer's goal was to charm and assert his way to the shore of approval. A lost cause, rude Leonard, because what is desired of Mailer is that he fail. Leonard explained, Part of this desire derives from envy. No man should be able to write so variously, so well, so successfully. Mailer's career is outrageous. A public punishment must be inflicted. Mailer is made into the scapegoat who must accept the blame for our not being as good as he is, and he conspires at it himself. Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote in his journal, Norman is a most gifted writer who should stick to writing. He is a victim of a society that consumes writers not as writers, but as public personalities. It must be added that he is a self-chosen victim, and only half the blame attaches to society. The day after the party, on February 5th, the U.S. Senate passed a resolution to create something called the Watergate Committee. According to biographer Carl Rollison, Mailer, at 2.30 a.m. on the night of the party, confided to a friend, I blew it. It was a great party and I blew it. I have a demon inside me. You're listening to the podcast, A Writer's Crime, created and narrated by Tim Lemire. That's me. The musical theme of this podcast is the second movement of the Mandolin Concerto in C Major, RV 425, by Antonio Vivaldi. That piece, along with all the musical transitions in this podcast, are arranged and performed by guitarist-composer Raymond Gonzalez. You can find him online at RaymondGonzalez.net. What about Adele Morales Mailer? What became of her after 1960? According to a New York Times article called The Woman in the Shadow, published shortly after Norman Mailer's death in 2007, Adele reared her two daughters aided by alimony and child support from her famous former husband. Adele reportedly found work at a woman's department store in Manhattan and used her art background to create window displays. At the time the article was written, Adele was 82 years old, living in a rent-stabilized one-bedroom apartment in Manhattan's Upper East Side. The Times article painted a rather sad picture of Adele, an elderly woman muttering in the streets about Norman Mailer and how far she'd fallen in life, coming home to an apartment cluttered with found objects and material for her artwork. Adele Mailer did not get rich from the publication of her memoir, The Last Party, and the book hardly made her a household name. By the time the book was published, in 1997, Norman Mailer had married and divorced three other women and was on his sixth wife, having fathered or adopted five more children for a total of nine. As far as the public was concerned, the author of The Last Party was one of Mailer's many wives, or the one he stabbed 37 years prior. The New York Times profile of Adele Mailer ends with her saying that on the day after her former husband, Norman Mailer, had died, she sensed a presence in her small apartment. And I looked up, and there he was, all dressed up in this suit, totally like a statue. I couldn't see through him like in those corny movies. And my first reaction was anger. Get out! I don't want you here, she said. I'm not cuckoo, she added, but he's been visiting me. Adele Mailer died on November 22, 2017, almost eight years to the day 
after Norman Mailer died. She was 90 years old. Why wasn't Norman Mailer's professional reputation ruined after he stabbed his wife? There are several possible reasons. The fact that Adele survived the stabbing may have led some people, including the judges hearing the case, to imagine that her injuries had not been all that grave. Of course, they were very serious indeed, and had Adele died from them, there can be little question that Norman Mailer would have been arrested and charged with murder, or at the very least, with manslaughter. The fact, too, that Adele chose not to press charges against her husband also may have contributed to a misperception that the incident wasn't all that serious. The stabbing also took place in 1960, more than half a century ago. There was no internet, no 24-hour news cycle, and the news, print and TV, was not as concerned as it is today with the malfeasance of celebrities. In 1960, a story about a domestic incident in New York City that involved someone getting stabbed may have struck more than a few people as tawdry and distasteful, not something they wanted to hear about or know about. In 1960, there was no social media, no viral posts or videos. If today a famous author were to assault his or her spouse, a witness might catch the event on their phone. When people see an event taking place, it takes on a new dimension of reality for them. Most people in 1960 did not see or know Adele's face, so she had no reality for them. Also in 1960, the public's awareness of the seriousness of domestic violence was not what it is today. Many people in 1960 may have heard about the Mailer incident and thought, well, that's unfortunate, but she probably provoked him, and it's none of my business anyway. Finally, what are we to make of Norman Mailer? Should we cancel Norman Mailer because he stabbed his wife? Should we not read or recommend his books? This is a question we ask ourselves more and more often whenever the misdeeds of beloved celebrities or public figures come to light, or even when only accusations or the suggestion of misdeeds come to light. Personally, I would argue that reading Norman Mailer, in spite of the failings of his personal life, does not make you a bad person. Just like not reading him, because of his personal failings, does not make you a good person. You do not need a reason not to read someone's books. What distinguishes Norman Mailer from someone like Woody Allen or Roman Polanski is that Mailer is no longer alive, and his fame and celebrity belong very much to the past. Relatively few people read, discuss, or gossip about Norman Mailer, as they once did, and even at the height of Mailer's celebrity, he was more of a literary celebrity. He was never as famous as Woody Allen, O.J. Simpson, or Bill Cosby. Even in the 1960s and 1970s, a good number of people may have recognized the name Norman Mailer without ever having read one of his books or knowing much about him, except that he was a writer and some kind of tough guy with a big ego. I would say that anyone who is at least curious to read Norman Mailer might start with his book The Fight about Muhammad Ali or Armies of the Night about the March on the Pentagon. Norman Mailer wanted to be much more than a writer, either because he was ambitious or he was trying to feed a psychological need within him. There is, in my opinion, something of a Me Too aspect to Mailer, as he tries to figure out how to, in his words from advertisements for myself, make a revolution in the consciousness of his times. 
Mailer sees Truman Capote and Gore Vidal adapt their writing for the stage. He tries that too. Mailer sees Capote write a nonfiction novel about murder. Mailer does that too. Mailer sees Andy Warhol make his own films. Well, Mailer tries that too. As we have heard Mailer say in the fourth episode of this podcast, he went through phases of trying on different personalities, which extends to different projects. Part of Mailer's adventurism, I think, is to pursue these different personalities and projects without a clear sense of whether they would stick or not. Mailer seems to find, or want, credit for the attempt more than for the results. He locates a kind of heroism into diving into an enterprise without knowing how or where it will end. Norman Mailer grew up as a short Jewish kid with big ears, one who came home after school to make model airplanes and read copies of Spicy Detective magazine. When the application for admission to Harvard University asked young Mailer what novels he had read and enjoyed, he lied and wrote down titles of books that he hadn't read. He wasn't even an English major in college. He was an engineering major. But as an undergraduate, he entered a national short story contest and won. After college, he entered the armed services, wrote a novel, and that book became a bestseller. Mailer did not have the long years of struggle and rejection before hitting it big that most writers have. What Mailer had were critics perhaps eager to knock the young best-selling author off his pedestal. And Mailer didn't have the kind of background or upbringing that some of his favorite writers had. He didn't fish and hunt in Michigan like Ernest Hemingway. He didn't grow up poor and in a rough neighborhood like John Farrell, author of the Studs Lonigan books. It sometimes happens, I think, that good little boys need to show the world, or themselves, that they can be naughty. Children to whom much is given sometimes grow up to become entitled adults who think that they can just do and say as they please. And a child who isn't sure who or what he is can sometimes need to push, prod, and provoke other people to see in their reaction proof that he exists. Mailer's first mayoral bid in 1960, the second mayoral bid of 1969, and the disastrous 50th birthday party of 1973, taken together, suggest a man who has big ideas, but who is short on details, and who, rather than fail because of poor planning or low self-confidence, preferred, consciously or unconsciously, to sabotage his own efforts and place the blame on a demon that lived inside him. What Mailer never said publicly, not to my knowledge, is that at the time he stabbed his wife, his life was dominated by a reckless combination of unresolved psychological issues and substance abuse, marijuana, alcohol, and pills. Of the stabbing, biographer Carl Rollison writes, he could not admit that he, Norman Mailer, had simply been out of control. Perhaps. Sometimes, when people admit that their lives are out of control, they have taken the first step to changing their life. That is a very hard step indeed to take. Other people, however, when they say their lives are out of control, aren't interested in changing their lives for the better. They say, I was out of control, as a way of telling other people, you can't hold me responsible for what I did or said. As for how the New York court system handled the Mailer case, I don't think the conclusion to draw is that the courts or our legal system is flawed. Rather, that it's not perfect. Norman Mailer committed a crime, and the punishment did not fit. In that sense, the justice system failed. I believe that we can and should recognize 
that our system of justice sometimes fails. We don't have to tolerate that fact, but we can recognize it. That recognition should inspire us not to adopt a facile cynicism, but to take constructive action. And there is an important distinction between accounting for someone's behavior and making excuses for it. To make excuses is to justify and validate the behavior. To account for the behavior is to understand as best as one can why it happened and what contributed to the outcome. I think we can try to comprehend why Norman Mailer acted the way he did without making excuses for him. I think that for anyone who discusses or researches this topic further, the most important thing to bear in mind is that Adele Mailer and Norman Mailer were people. They're not characters in a story that we can easily figure out. They were three-dimensional, living, breathing people. They had their strengths, as we all do. They had their flaws, as we all do. Each of them was better than the worst thing they ever did or said. Adele and Norman are no longer alive, but there are people alive who call them mom and dad, grandpa and grandma. Those people undoubtedly have happy memories of Adele and of Norman, despite their flaws, their shortcomings, or the bad things that happened. Just because we may never understand something doesn't mean we cannot or should not talk about it, reflect on it, and continue to ask questions, lest we fall victim to the tempting notion that we know it all. You've been listening to A Writer's Crime with me, Tim Lemire. Thank you very much for listening.